The content warnings for this presentation includes mentions of sexual abuse, child sexual part violence, bereavement, parts language, integration language, and self and I based language. My name is Teresa Slater. My pronouns are she, they. I am a white feminine person with shoulder length blonde hair in a peach colored top in a small circle of the bottom right hand of the screen. Behind me is a slide presentation titled Young Perspective, Jungian Perspectives, the Significance of the Unconscious in a DID System. I'm joining you today from Toronto. The name originates from a Mohawk word meaning the place where the trees stand in the water. I identify as a 43 year old gender fluid neuroqueer woman with a self led plural identity. I'm physically able and mid sized. I celebrate being bisexual, polyamorous, and kinky. I live with medication managed psychosis and I am celebrating one year and five months cannabis free. I was raised by a single mother on disability benefits and I acknowledge and appreciate the privilege of my university education. As an Anglican Christian and seventh generation white settler Canadian, my faith informs my values of love, acceptance and reconciliation. I am an art therapy student at the Toronto Art Therapy Institute graduating in 2025 and I wrote the paper I'm presenting today for a class on Jungian psychology. In 2016, I became an MA graduate of OCAD University in contemporary art design and new media art histories with a specialization in technology and intersectional feminism. In 2013, I was awarded a Bachelor's of Philosophy degree with a minor in Applied Ethics from the University of Victoria in BC. And in my youth, I studied mixed media, craft and design at the Cooney School of Arts in Nelson, BC. This creative essay explores the influence of obscured thoughts and images on the conscious mind, drawing from personal experiences and quotes from Man and His Symbols by Young in 1964. It delves into the impact of intrusive thoughts stemming from trauma, the passive influence of parts within a dissociative identity adaption system, and the importance of shadow work. I examine the role of the unconscious as a conscious part in a DID system. We look at how unconscious contents arise and their impact on consciousness and how dreams are the restorer of psychological balance. And I conclude with the integration of conscious and unconsciousness for mental stability. By reflecting on personal experiences and considering the insights from Young, I attempt to provide a comprehensive understanding of the interplay between conscious and unconsciousness aspects of the mind. Reading from the slide, this subliminal material can consist of all urges, impulses and intentions, all perceptions and intuitions, all rational and irrational thoughts, conclusions, inductions, deductions and premises and all varieties of feeling, any or all of these can be partial, temporary, or constant unconsciousness. About two years ago, coinciding with the disintegrative um, psychotic episode, I discovered that I was a dissociative identity adaption system. I experienced amnesia and time loss for years, unaware of my parts communicating to me through my unconscious. They deliberately kept me, self or host, in the dark while most of my parts knew I was a system. According to Young, the unconscious influences of our waking life and as a system, I argue that the unconscious may be a fully conscious part of a system. In this quote, Young suggests that the unconsciousness possesses capacities similar to the conscious mind, including thoughts, perceptions, and feelings. In a system, my system, many of my unconscious parts are entirely whole with their thoughts, perceptions, and emotions. My unconscious played a crucial role in expressing the fullness 
authority, and wholeness of my system that operated for 40 years without my knowledge. While I was unaware I was a system, my parts continued to experience life passively or when they fronted. I had occasional suspicions of being a system. For example, it was common to meet people who knew me intimately when I had no recollection of who they were and they would describe conversations with me or events I attended with them while I had total amnesia about the experiences. I routinely engaged in inner dialogue, even negotiating who gets to front based on situation and demands. And while I strongly identified as being multiple, I didn't understand what a system was. Another thing that led me to believe I might be plural was my gender fluidity. Even as a youth, I identified as bi-gender. I am a boy. I am a girl. Given my cultural upbringing, I concluded that this duality was an essential aspect of my soul given masculine and feminine traits. Further, my horoscope influenced it. I am a Gemini, and I took the idea of being a twin literally, knowing that I experienced contradicting gender identities. During the aforementioned psychotic episode, my disintegration made me discover my system transparently. I became co-conscious with many parts, approximately eight distinct personas existed in my ego space. My system adhered to a law governed by an ancient feminine judge. This judge was responsible for deciding when and who fronted depending on what life experience was occurring. I understand this judge represents my higher self or the consciousness that perceives that it is conscious. This felt presence of awareness, which Jung might call the archetype of a high priestess, symbolized a level of consciousness that transcended ordinary understanding and provided guidance. There were many terrifying aspects to realizing I was a part of a system because I didn't know who I shared a body with. Knowing that I had chronic amnesia, I imagined the worst, probably due to the internalized stigma of the violent media representations of plurality. For most of my life, I couldn't remember or accept the trauma I had endured that gave me the diagnosis, diagnosis of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I worried I had killed somebody when I was very young because I always had this reoccurring dream that a body I had buried would be discovered. So when I realized the time loss I was experiencing was because other parts were fronting, I didn't know what they were capable of and wondered, could it be murder? Now that the psychosis has passed, I understand who my parts are and how my system operates. My system can be likened to a carousel where all parts switch rapidly, creating an almost streamless consciousness. However, I still perceive their divisions and the cyclical nature of who's fronting. While I might not be always conscious of the specific impacts of each part, I am influenced by their feelings and thoughts and often hear internal narratives. A tremendous strength to being plural is that this unconscious influence grants me access to different perspectives without necessarily changing my positionality. When I first discovered I was a system, the carousel moved very slowly. There was no continuity of consciousness. Instead, I experienced each part to be definitively separate from the overarching source of self-consciousness. During the slowness, I became co-conscious and aware of all the parts in my headspace or inner world. Through this process, I gained a newfound clarity that enabled the identification, labeling, understanding, communication, and locating each part within my system. I turned to art to draw maps and used art to explain to my psychiatrist and therapist what my system looked like. My mind felt like the veil of unconsciousness had been dismantled during my discovery. This is an image of my system map. This is an image description. There are three centrical spheres labeled conscious host, personal unconsciousness, and universal unconsciousness radiating outwards. 
The center sphere, conscious host, has four parts. The personal unconscious sphere has eight parts and four interjects of my dead family sharing a border with the conscious host sphere. The personal unconscious sphere has an additional five parts shared with the collective unconsciousness sphere and the collective unconsciousness sphere has four independent parts. First, I recognize this is a masculine approach that is rooted in the patriarchal and colonial history of map and border making. If I were to approach this exercise again, I would consider the difference between a map and the terrain. The terrain of my system is colorful, fluid, and ever-changing. This map is a snapshot of my current consciousness, which is always fluid and in flux. These boundaried parts are not static or fixed. And secondly, I recognize the impact of self spells and self fulfilling prophecies that define how we think about ourselves. This image is one of the many ways I can represent my system. This image is not definitive of the complexities of living with plural consciousness. It is an effort to demonstrate in simple terms what it means for me to be conscious of parts. Reading from the slide, part of the unconscious consists of a multitude of temporarily obscured thoughts, impressions, and images that, in spite of being lost, continue to influence our conscious mind. The impacts of intrusive thoughts and trauma-related experiences have significantly affected my perception and understanding of the world. These intrusive thoughts, often relating to violence or harm, would occur in potentially dangerous situations. For example, simply passing by a wall corner would trigger vivid images in my head of, of my head being smashed against it. Merely passing by a wall is not inherently dangerous, but perhaps where I was going was. This suggests that the specific protector part within my system was trying to control my behavior as a means of protection. I sought professional help for these violent and intrusive thoughts and was finally diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder and prescribed antipsychotics. In addition to the medication, through years of therapy and uncovering repressed childhood memories, I discovered that becoming conscious of these memories helped alleviate these intrusive thoughts. Now that I know I'm a system, I listen when I think about accidentally hurting myself and acknowledge that a protector is trying to protect me from something. These unconscious thoughts are not as violent as they were in the past, but they still bubble up in ways that I could be harmed if I pursue my path. Aside from intrusive thoughts, obscured thoughts and images influence my consciousness through the passive influence of parts within my system. My primary host, Teresa, or me, does not think in images. Instead, her conscious inner world is just a black expanse. However, I do sometimes experience predominant and high definition images. These images can be benign, like a lavender field or a dish, or representative of an experience that's about to happen, like the image of an office room right before a job interview. These images are striking, but they're not how I usually think. They are passive influences from parts. Although I may not always be consciously aware of the parts in my daily life, I acknowledge their presence and am reminded of who they are when they show me things. When I don't identify the passive influences exerted by these parts, I tend to engage in self-abandonment and self-sabotage. I avoid this by watching for images that flash into my consciousness and I try to attend to their symbolic meaning. The passive influences from parts often regress my behavior, making me act younger and unable to fulfill my adult responsibilities. Like many survivors of childhood sexual abuse, 
I have a hypersexual child part, Nova. Before I was aware I was a system, in my dating life, I would regress during sexual intimacy. My childlike ways excited potential perpetrators and confused high-value partners. For years, while I explored finding a partner, fear and shame were two dominant emotions that shaped my experience and perceptions. This is where shadow work becomes crucial. To operate as a self-led system, I must acknowledge and integrate various perspectives and values from my headmates, including hypersexual parts. Exploring their perspectives might reveal undesirable or shameful aspects, and so I disassociate from them. Integrating these parts into my conscious identity requires self-compassion and an understanding that their purpose is to protect me. One central pattern of my unconscious mind influencing my conscious experience relates to safety. Despite living in a secure environment with physical autonomy, financial stability, and emotional sovereignty, I consistently feel an underlining and unending fear in the pit of my stomach. In DID culture, this is known as an EP or an emotional part. These parts are fragmented and not whole consciousness, they are feeling states. The fear and shame I feel in my body used to come and go like an EP and are almost always attached to the expression of my sexuality. In my relationship, this EP manifests into the unconscious belief that I am unlovable. Reading the slide, the more that consciousness is influenced by prejudice, errors, fantasies, and infantile wishes, the, the more the already existing gap will widen into a neurotic dissociation and lead to more or less artificial life far removed from healthy instincts, nature, or truth. The general function of dreams is to try to restore our psychological balance by producing dream material that reestablished in a stubble way, subtle way, the total psychic equilibrium. Recognizing the influences of prejudice, fantasies, and infantile wishes on our consciousness is challenging but essential. Dissociation and detachment from healthy instincts can hinder our ability to make sound decisions in various aspects of life, particularly relationships. However, through introspection and self-awareness, we can work towards re-establishing a connection with our instincts and fostering healthier behaviors. Additionally, dreams can serve as a way to restore psychological balance and address forgotten aspects of the psyche, including the processes of including processing the loss of loved ones. I have faced difficulty recognizing the impact of prejudice and fantasy on my thoughts, behaviors, and decision-making processes. Identifying how biases, dreams, and wishes influence our consciousness can be challenging, requiring introspection and self-awareness. When these unconscious influences are perceived as shameful, the mind uses, quote, neurotic dissociation to keep them at bay. This is shadow work. Identifying and labeling unconscious drives, sublimating them into acceptable expressions, and using ample self-compassion to regulate the disassociation. Dissociation and attachment from healthy instincts have affected various aspects of my life, particularly relationships. When reflecting on behavior regarding sexuality and dating, I can identify numerous instances where I ignored red flags, that unconscious ick when something doesn't add up, and I didn't trust my intuition. This lack of self-trust stems from feelings of unworthiness in seeking and maintaining loving relationships. Recognizing these patterns and working towards reestablishing a connection with healthy instincts becomes essential in fostering more beneficial relationships. 
During the journey of self-discovery within my system, I encountered memories and emotions that had long been buried. Dreams played a significant role in restoring psychological balance and addressing the forgotten aspects of my psyche. One part of my system, Atlas, emerged as a memory keeper during a psychiatric stay at the hospital. Uncovering memories from my childhood through Atlas allowed me to experience them firsthand and understanding my past from a first person perspective. One cherished memory in particular was napping face to face with my mother when I was three years old and feeling the warmth of her breath on my lips. Dreams also served a way for me to process the loss of loved ones with routine dreams portraying my deceased mother as alive only for me to become conscious within the dream and realizing the truth, thus impacting my emotional state and ultimately rousing me awake. Reading the slide. For the sake of mental stability and even psychological health, the unconsciousness and the consciousness must be integrally connected and thus move on parallel lines. If they are split apart or, quote, dissociated, psychological disturbances follows. In this respect, dream symbols are the essential message carriers from the instinctive to the rational parts of the human mind, and their interpretation enriches the poverty of consciousness so that it learns to understand again the forgotten language of instincts. Dreams play a crucial role in bridging the gap between instinctive and rational parts of the mind, aiding in maintaining psychological balance. Dissociation gives rise to disturbances such as amnesia and time loss, disrupting the continuity of the conscious experience. However, by exploring and interpreting the dreamscape from different parts' perspectives, I gain valuable insight into my system's unconscious, connection, unconscious intentions and inner workings. When I awake each mo morning and reflect on my dreams, it is obvious which part is fronting in the dreamscape space. Each dream represents a unique perspective reflecting the age, gender, preoccupation, and roles of different parts within my system. By recognizing and interpreting these dreams, I gain a, gain a deeper understanding of the unconscious intentions of my parts. Reading the slide, a man likes to believe he is the master of his soul. But as long as he is unable to control his moods and emotions or to be conscious of the myriad secret ways in which unconscious factors insinuate themselves into his arrangements and decisions, he is certainly not his own master. These unconscious factors owe their existence to the autonomy of archetypes. Integrating the conscious and unconscious aspect of the mind is crucial for maintaining mental stability. When disassociation occurs, it disrupts this connection and can lead to various disruptions. One way to understand and strengthen this integration is by exploring the role of dreams in system communication. Discovering I was a system has allowed me to reflect more clearly on my moods and emotions. Previously, I used to believe that I was misdiagnosed as having a rapid cycling bipolar disorder as my moods would frequently change throughout the day. However, with trauma therapy and learning about the window of tolerance, I have gained better control over my emotions. After years of somatic training and regulating my nervous system, I no longer oscillate between hyper and hypo states and I no, no longer experience hypomania. It feels empowering to regulate my nervous system and to connect with my emotions. I often uncover unconscious factors that influence my decision making in therapy sessions. While it can be challenging to discuss these instances, they always provide valuable insights. Fear significantly impacts me, preventing me from pursuing achievements and ambitions. Although I do take calculated risks, 
there are moments where I find myself sabotaging my progress. One of my deepest wounds is feeling unlovable. This unconscious programming manifests in all areas of my life. However, I have made considerable progress through these issues and now believe that I am deeply and profoundly lovable. Understanding the connection between our conscious and unconscious parts is essential for mental stability. By exploring how dissociation can disrupt this connection and the role of dreams and system communication, we can gain valuable insights into our unconscious intentions and foster healthier integration of our minds. Through the help of a professional care network, medication, and faith, I am a self-led system. I control my moods by being conscious of the myriad secret ways that my unconscious parts impact my decisions, and by reflecting on personal experiences and considering the insights from Young, I hope I have provided a comprehensive understanding of the interplay between conscious and unconscious aspects of the mind. I have uncovered obscure thoughts and images as they influence my consciousness and how dreams significantly restore psychological balance. Here are some suggestions for further engagement. Jung's concept of archetypes suggests universal, system, universal symbols and themes that influence the human psyche. How might these archetypes manifest within the various parts of a DID system and how do they contribute to the system dynamics and functions? As Jung described it, shadow work involves acknowledging and integrating the psyche's unconscious aspects. How does shadow work unfold within plural systems and what strategies can parts employ to foster integration? Investigating the long-term outcomes and resilient factors within plural systems, including factors contributing to adaptive functioning, integration, and overall well-being, what factors promote resilience and thriving within plural systems, and how can these insights inform support services and community resources? Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I am open to questions, comments, and feedback, and they can be sent to TeresaSlater at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram at SlaterTimes.